Welcome to the 2015 podcast on temperature regulation physiology. First, let's uh, make sure that you have your goals and objectives for this podcast uh, locked in and you should review the content outline that 2014 is not very much different from the previous year. Um, the uh, monitoring methods uh, for temperature need to be covered. Uh, hypothermia, etiology, prevention, treatment, complications, prognosis also included. Temperature regulation I'll cover some of the physiology of temperature regulation and uh, the effect of drugs on uh, temperature regulation. To uh, cut the chase, let's um, deal with the uh, key points I consider uh, chapter 48 in uh, Miller's textbook to be uh, thoroughly adequate for this uh, podcast. And uh, at this point we'll go over the uh, the key points uh, as enumerated in that chapter. And uh, the podcast will cover most of them. So first, general anesthetics decrease the thresholds, the triggering core temperatures for vasoconstriction and shivering by two to three degrees centigrade. This means that uh, anesthetics uh, prevent you from uh, shivering. Number two, anesthetic induced impairment of thermoregulatory control combined with a cool operating room environment makes most people hypothermic. Number three, the major initial cause of hypothermia in most patients is core to peripheral redistribution of body heat. Number four, not only does general anesthesia impair thermoregulation, but so does neuraxial anesthesia and is associated with substantial hypothermia as well. Number five, large randomized trials have proved that even mild hypothermia, that is 1.5 to 2 degrees hypothermia, causes adverse outcomes, including a threefold increase in morbid myocardial outcomes, a threefold increase in risk for wound infection, coagulopathy, and the need for allogeneic transfusion, prolonged recovery, and prolonged hospitalization. Number six, body temperature should be monitored in patients undergoing surgery lasting longer than 30 minutes, and core temperature should be maintained at 36 degrees C or higher whenever possible. Forced air warming techniques currently offer the best combination of high efficacy, low cost, and remarkable safety, to quote Dr. Sessler. Now let's look at normal thermoregulation. Normal thermoregulation is a function of afferent impulses. Cold signals are carried by A delta fibers and warm signals are carried by unmyelinated C fibers through the spinothalamic tracts of the anterior spinal cord. Central control resides in the hypothalamus, but there are also uh, control mechanisms in the spinal cord and the brains and the brain stem. The control of autonomic responses is 80% from core structures and the control of behavioral responses is half from the skin surface input. Efferent responses 
include vasodilatation and sweating or vasoconstriction at the capillary and arterial venous levels and shivering. Shivering is what is considered a behavioral response. To recap and go through these three um, aspects, uh, afferent impulses are carried through the anterior spinal thalamic tract, central control is in the hypothalamus, and efferent responses include sweating and vasoconstriction or shivering. This summary of a publication in 2008 authored by Dr. Sessler is uh, a, an excellent resource. And um, I will, you will find that uh, many uh, of the uh, tables in the Miller chapter will come from this um, um, review article. As already mentioned, most metabolic heat is lost via the skin surface. This is counteracted by cutaneous vasoconstriction. Skin blood flow is divided into two categories, nutritional or capillary, and thermoregulatory, also known as arterial venous shunts. These arterial venous shunts are either on or off and can convey large amount of blood compared to capillaries. Approximately 10% of cardiac output traverses these arterial venous shunts and consequently shunt vasoconstriction can increase um, mean arterial blood pressure significantly. The normal interthreshold range is a mere 0.3 degrees. This is defined by the sweating threshold at the upper end and by the vasoconstriction threshold at the lower end. However, under general anesthesia, the interthreshold range increases 20-fold and patients are essentially poikilothermic within this range while receiving general anesthesia. Another uh, review article dealing with thermoregulation and temperature monitoring, etc., also authored by Dr. Sessler, published in 2006, provides a uh, uh, schema of uh, the um, uh, nerves and sensors, etc., involved with thermoregulation. The um, cartoon on this slide is a depiction of core to peripheral redistribution. Under anesthesia, the uh, core temperature of 37 degrees falls while the periphery is warmed under uh, uh, anesthesia when there is uh, loss of thermoregulation. Mean body temperature is a concept that uh, takes into consideration that one single temperature in one location does not necessarily uh, tell the whole story. Um, when thermoregulation is studied, uh, many sites are, um, are examined.
to uh, reiterate, temperatures are not uniform within the body. Consequently, temperatures measured at each site have different physiologic and practical uh, significance. Impaired re thermal regulation is more important than exposure to cold environment in the, in the development of inadvertent hypothermia. Therefore, in conclusion, it's our fault. Hypothermia is a result of the uh, various um, anesthetic agents or techniques that are used. Now let's talk about neuraxial anesthesia, spinal anesthesia. Um, as all of you uh, have probably uh, noticed, uh, the uh, a patient who is uh, under spinal anesthesia has no no sensation uh, of their their limbs, and uh, likewise they may deny feeling cold when in fact they are hypothermic. The brain may interpret warm legs to mean a warm patient. Uh, vasoconstriction, the lower thermoregulatory response, is inhibited in blocked areas. Uh, likewise, the awake patient may not uh, undergo um, core temperature monitoring uh, and hypothermia may go undetected until they arrive in PACU and an oral temperature is taken. Um, it has been observed that warming the skin may reduce shivering in patients who have had neuraxial anesthesia. Um, spinal anesthesia has uh, been studied and the um, and patients with residual spinal anesthesia can rewarm more quickly than those recovering from general endotracheal anesthesia when warm forced air is is used. This paper um, from 1997 examined the uh, the effect of active postoperative rewarming in spinal anesthetic patients. The main finding here is that the warming time in spinal patients was shorter than in patients who underwent general anesthesia. And this graph uh, depicts the uh, same information. Bring to your attention uh, how cold patients would become in the operating room in 1997. And uh, it was not uncommon for um, patients under anesthesia to um, fall to a temperature of 34 degrees Celsius. Now let's look at the complications of hypothermia. Coagulopathy. There is a cold induced platelet dysfunction. This is a local effect and um, meaning that uh, patients who have hypothermic platelets have platelets that don't work as well as they should or would when the, when the, the uh, patient's temperature is 37 degrees. There's also enzyme impairment, and this may not, not be detectable if the blood test is performed at 37 degrees as is often done in, in the lab. As a result of coagulopathy, there's an increased transfusion rate. Um, studies have shown that uh, wound infections are uh, uh, at a higher incidence with hypothermia. Other complications of hypothermia include uh, adverse cardiac outcomes and 
prolonged duration of medication, prolonged sedation, prolonged uh, neuromuscular blockade with uh, associated uh, co pulmonary complications. There are benefits of hypothermia and um, it's used therapeutically in uh, some cases but uh, uh, overall cerebral ischemia is uh, uh, lessened in the case of uh, hypothermia so one consider, could consider this to be a, a an advantage of mild hypothermia. It is used uh, in neurosurgery and has been shown to improve outcome after stroke. Where should you measure temperature? Well the um, pulmonary artery is the gold standard of course we can't measure pulmonary artery temperature in everybody therefore uh, studies have shown that uh, it correlates extremely well with distal esophageal temperature uh, perhaps at the point of maximal heart sounds if you were using the uh, esophageal stethoscope uh, the nasopharynx is also a core temperature it is perhaps a little bit uh, more difficult to uh, place the nasopharyngeal temperature probe correctly, um, I recommend that you uh, uh, insert the temperature probe until you feel some sort of resistance or uh, maybe perhaps a, a, a few centimeters past the nares uh, at, the, um, at the entrance of the uh, nose. Um, this should put the temperature probe uh, in the area of the turbinates, a very well perfused area of the nose. Now the tympanic membrane is uh, another core temperature, however this is usually uh, uh, used for uh, scientific um, experiments. Uh, it requires a, uh, a s special temperature probe. It's, relatively, it's somewhat invasive um, it's often uh, only used in awake patients and the patient places the uh, tympanic membrane temperature uh, sensor in the uh, uh, auditory canal uh, and uh, it, because uh, you know, place, placing it uh, in the unconscious patient could possibly you know, cause trauma. Um, rectal temperature is considered an intermediate temperature the bladder temperature, well, during cardiac surgery, uh, bladder temperature is intermediate when urine flow is low, but it could be considered core or equal to, uh, be found to be equal to pulmonary artery temperature when the urine flow is high. Um, with respect to cardiac surgery, uh, the adequacy of rewarming of the patient from the hypothermia is best evaluated by considering both core and intermediate temperatures. Other areas of uh, temperature monitoring include the axillary temperature, which may be accurate if uh, placed over the axillary artery and the arms are tucked. Infrared scanning of the external auditory canal is not considered to be very accurate. This is not the same as the tympanic membrane. Uh, the, the accuracy of infrared temporal artery measurement is also not thought to be uh, accurate enough, although it is a commonly employed technique in uh, the uh, PACU. Temperature changes in the first 30 minutes of general anesthesia are said to be difficult to interpret and this is a rationale for monitoring uh, only for when cases uh, exceed 30 minutes. Um, here's a slide which uh, is 10 years old uh, and shows the basic standards uh, for monitoring uh, temperature and uh, the ASA standard is to uh, monitor temperature when clinically significant changes in body temperature are intended, anticipated, or suspected. 
There's a lot of material to cover in this podcast, and I'm going to break it up into uh, small portions. And this is going to be the uh, uh, end of part one. Um, you can pick up uh, on part two when you're ready.